So it's incredible to have Sandra Okapinti here with us today with over 30 years experience and she's currently the Research Director of Discovery at the CSIRO Mineral Resources. So I'm so thankful that she's joined us today to chat about innovating for future exploration success. So it's going to be an awesome session. Please use the chat. You'll have the chance to jump off mute. We'll open up the floor for discussions at the end of the presentation. And I hope you all enjoy it. So thank you so much, Sandra. Okay, so thanks very much, Jess. And um, before I um, start, I just want would like to acknowledge the traditional um, owners from where I'm speaking from. The For me, it's the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to, to their elders um, past and present. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Cool. Um, so I'm not going to be as funny as Cam, um, unfortunately, perhaps for you, but um, today I'm just going to talk about some of the things that my team um, are working on. Uh, and uh, if I can, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> so basically, um, as you know, within Australia, we have, um, you know, we've got a vast continent, lots of mineral resources. Um, some of them are dotted here on this map. This is just for mines, I think, that the dots on this particular map. But we're faced with the challenge of trying to work out what, what lies beneath the cover. And when I talk about cover, I don't mean just cover in those really, really yellow areas on the map, but the cover with even within those well endowed areas um, <clears throat> that we have, because the cover is um, expert at hiding um, what lies beneath. And um, um, he, at CSIRO, we're trying to work out different ways of seeing through it. Um, before I continue, I just want to acknowledge the people that have contributed to this, this work or are contributing to this work at the moment. This is uh, my team, the Discovery team. Um, we also have got in, in there some people from the Deep Earth Imaging Future Science Platform. Um, and ba basically what, what I've tried to build or what we've tried to build is a really diverse team um, of very enthusiastic researchers. Um, and the reason for that is that we want free thought. We want people not to be afraid to innovate and put up really crazy ideas. So um, it's really important, I think, for discovery um, that we um, we are brave, we're courageous, and we're, we're not not afraid to, to to ask a question that some people might think is com completely crazy, um, or or try something new. new. Um, so in order to be able to uh, see beneath the, the cover, we have to think. Um, we have to use a systems approach to thinking. Okay, so we have to try to, you know, and, and these approaches, this mineral systems approach has been around for, for decades now, um, you know, so since since the 90s. Um, and we still use this approach, which is which is fine. Um, but within this approach, perhaps we sometimes we dumb it down a lot. So we, we sort of say we're just going to map for a few different critical elements that might have contributed to the de development of a particular type of mineral deposit or, or mineral system. Um, and sometimes we, we overthink it as well. So we, we are looking for way too much detail, way too early. And, and so it, we, we get um, perhaps distracted um, in, in what, we're, what we're doing. Um, the same approach won't work in, in every different region. Um, and that's often because of what the nature of the cover, um, uh, the cover that we're dealing with um, is, is composed of, um, or how thick it is, and actually its composition as well. I'm going to touch on this as we go through. Um, in terms of mineral systems, this is some work that I did um, quite a few years ago where I basically looked at a number of different types of mineral deposits and I just collated them. And this is just a summary of, of some of that collation. Um, and I used a binary approach to look at what those critical elements are um, between those different um, deposits. So you can see here, you don't need to read this, but basically, you know, just look at where all the yeses line up or where most of the noes line up. And we use this, um, this is when I was at the CET Centre for Exploration Targeting at, at, at UWA to, to work out how to um, translate the mineral systems idea into um, critical elements and maps. Um, again, this is around mineral systems. I won't dwell on this. You've probably seen this um, many, many times before. Um, on the left here, um, McKay, Cam and, and John and John Ronsky put together a very simplified approach to mineral systems, which works quite well in some in some respects. But it doesn't tell you what to um, what sort of data to collect or how to collect that data um, in different regions to to try to um, assure a bit more exploration success. Um, myself and others uh, took that another step further, and we tried to. Um, uh, 
communicate what sorts of features to look for in, in different, um, you know, that talk back to these sorts of data. So deep crustal scale structures, um, you know, what they are basically, and therefore um, by implication, what kind of data to use to map for them. Um, but in all of this, in exploration, in, in, in narrowing down your search area, um, in, in finding the right uh, types of deposits, um, what's really important is that we have a model Okay, and we're flexible about our model. Okay, so we're always rethinking our model. Um, we go on a journey around that model. So we, um, you know, we're collecting different types of data. We're putting it together in different ways. We're really thinking about what it means. Um, and um, what we're developing at CSIRO are a number of decision support tools to help us um, along that journey. Okay, so one of the issues that we have in, um, in targeting or, or exploration is um, integrating data that are collected at different scales, um, uh, different resolutions, and that are speaking to different scales. And so here's some work that Mark Lindsay um, and others did uh, a, a while back, um, where what we tried to do was we tried to co um, collate or correlate um, uh, different petrophysical or different geophysical data sets. Um, and with, with mapping and, and other um, data, I'm just going to move your faces from my screen, sorry. <laughs> um, and what we, you know, obviously the, the problem we came up with was that we were comparing 1D data from, from drill core, okay, um, to 2D mapping and to these other, all these other um, uh, 2D or 3D data sets, and they all talk to different scales. Um, and we really struggled to cor correlate the um, uh, across those scales. Um, so now I'm just gonna go through um, a number of different types of um, sort of uh, work that we've been doing at CSIRO and that, that do cross cut those different scales. So here's um, some work um, that the DEI FSP have just recently done, um, looking at um, seismic velocity models or developing new seismic um, velocity uh, models for across the continent. Now, these are obviously really interesting and really important because they're mapping the depth of different basins across the continent. Now, this is just one scale of, of these data, of, of this um, particular um, study that I'm showing. Um, but perhaps one of the most in interesting things really is what's going on down here at the um, uh, the, the boundary with the mantle. So um, obviously in exploration, we might look at these and think that, that these areas here um, where there's perturbations might be important because there might be some faults that are actually penetrating through um, the mantle. Um, at a different scale um, in geophysics, um, depth to cover is really important. Depth of cover is really important. And we're developing different ways of um, of getting to that depth of cover. So um, we're using multi-physics techniques. So where we use one geophysical data set to inform another geophysical data set um, to put together these 3D models um, for depth of, um, depth of cover. Um, uh, at a different scale again, so this is for the West Yulgarn, um, we're going back and re-looking at samples um, and re-analyzing just the geochemistry, whole rock geochemistry. But at the same time, um, the other thing we're doing is taking, is looking at the mineralogy. So we're, we're taking hyperspectral measurements of the same samples. And you can see here on the left, and let me find a pointer. I'm really challenged today. There's my pointer, is it gonna work? Here we go. All right, so um, here you can see the, the mineralogy, gibbsite, girthite, kaolinite. And here's a, um, uh, just a very roughly gridded uh, uh, map of um, lithium geochemistry from the same samples. If we, if we normalize the lithium geochemistry against the mineralogy, and we're not gonna move there. Okay, so, the other thing to note here is that this geochem is all, and the lithium and, and this mineralogy is from around 40 centimetres below the surface. So this um, mineralogy map or map of mineralogy is probably the first at that scale ever produced in the world. That's from below the surface, basically, at that scale. Now, let's move it forward. Now, if we normalise the geochem against the um, mineralogy, um, we're not seeing a lot of the detail in, in this gridded thing, but we actually get a different result. 
Okay, so that's telling us something about the um, where the um, different elements are sitting within minerals and if we're going to pick it up in, in, in certain mineralogies or not. So, or where it's, if it's coming through in that geochemistry. And that's the kind of thing that we're going to have to do going ahead. We're going to have to look at our data in different ways um, to, to open up our search space. Um, now I'm just going to just go segue back into mineral systems again um, and, and mineral potential mapping. Mineral potential mapping is basically applying a blunt instrument to define a search space. And it's it's basically, um, it's okay. Um, it's definitely not, not the answer to everything. It's what we do in our heads a lot of the time. And here's an example from GA where they um, they, they applied those, um, those ideas as mineral systems ideas for nickel um, endowment. Um, there's the workflow that they used. Um, here's some, um, and here's the Julemar deposit. So there's Julemar in here. Julemar is obviously an, an, a nickel, uh, is, is a, um, a PGE uh, nickel deposit, um, uh, only about 80 kilometres north of Perth. So I've got Perth here. And you basically can see um, the different the geophysical data sets. So gravity, gravity over magnetics, magnetics here. There's Julemar. There's a bit of a greenstone belt coming through there. And that's where the hotspot came up on um, the, the GA. Um, national scale um, uh, mineral potential map compilation. Um, so it, it works um, sometimes. Um, you need to think about the scale um, of the data that you're using and also what sort of system you're after and if that data are the right data for, for looking for that system. Um, here's an example of from the, this is hot off the press from the MINEX CRC. So here's some work from the Delamarian um, or, um, origin in, in South Australia. Uh, now the, this is this is a regional scale data set or maybe even getting down to a district scale data set. And the really interesting thing about this is that there's only the, the only outcrops up, up in here. Okay, there's, there's basically no outcrop here. So the geology map that's used for the targeting um, or the mineral potential mapping is, is all interpreted. There's hardly any data from here. So we're interpreting the um, the, the gravity, the magnetics to get this geology map, um, to get our structural map, and putting all of that together, getting crit, getting at our critical elements, so maybe fluid um, flow pathways, uh, favourable um, uh, rocks, essentially. There's no geochemistry um, into mineral potential um, uh, map products. Now, again, um, this is applying a blunt instrument, but it's taking a model, going through that, going through that journey and applying that blunt instrument to get to, to sort of focus your exploration efforts. Um, here's an example from um, the Kimberley, uh, where we um, did some mineral potential maps. We, we, we used different models um, for that region. So one of the things we did was we, we looked at um, uh, gold and nickel. Um, I was very unsatisfied with the work that I did there a number of years ago. Um, the, 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 I didn't like the gold and or, or the nickel um, uh, at the outputs um, from the mineral potential mapping. And so I asked a student to have a look at it. And so what she did was she took some area near Dimian data um, and she applied that isotopic data to, to the models. Now you can see here in the top here in this, in this figure here, she gridded the Samarium neodymium um, data here to, so that as a proxy for fertility. And you can see the output is absolutely revolting. Okay, we should never use these kinds of outputs. So instead of using that, she interpreted the um, fertility um, as related to um, uh, the, the, the neodymium values um, uh, manually um, for the region. And the result is that, so that this coloured um, map here is what I um, put together with Vashek Matelka and others. And you can see here that we, um, we have gold, I think fertility in the pinks and um, nickel um, in the in the these sort of more natural colours. Um, and these are these are for Reapers. So um, the results that she got, and you'll have to take my word for this, are actually a lot better than the results that we that we got. There's much more granularity, um, the the um, just the distribution of the uh, prospective regions makes a lot more sense um, using her approach. And I can't move forward. Here we go. Um, the, you know, early on I talked about a, the scale issue. We have to try to nest across different scales using different data sets. So we tried to do that for the Capricorn um, origin. In the top here, um, you can see there's a, a result of um, uh, 
mineral uh, potential for gold um, in, in, the, in the Southern Capricorn origin. Um, and that's just based on um, regional scale data sets. So basically all the geophysics, the, the geology, but at the regional scale. Um, then what we did was we, we added the geochemistry um, to, to take it down, um, perhaps a, uh, a scale. And then we added the hydrogeochemistry and you can see there's holes in the, in the outputs. Now, the reason why there are holes there is because the data didn't extend into those zones. We didn't think that the, the boreholes that, we, that we'd sampled um, or that we um, accessed the data from um, would be talking to these regions in here. And so we were very honest with our result, essentially. Okay, we're going to jump out back to the regional scale um, now again. So other types of data that you can collect that will help you to understand the whether or not an area is fertile. And here's some work that Susanna Smith and, uh, and others has um, has done or has been doing for, for a number of years, where they're basically looking at the sediments and the volcanoclastics in regions to map out the geodynamics, like how that, that region developed through time. So in terms of mineral systems, geodynamics is king. We, we know how a region formed at, at a particular time, we'll understand what type of um, mineral deposits may have, may have formed in, in, in those regions. Um, so this is um, what, what Susanna has, has done here. Now this um, often um, in geoscience, we look at the geochemistry um, in terms of fertility um, of, the, of granites, um, or, you know, of our magmatic um, rocks. So this really fills that gap um, from take, taking the, that, that information and, and eking it out of the sedimentary strata. So we, it only works really when you understand um, how the basin has developed as well. So that's really important. Um, and so this is um, some of the outcomes of that work where Susanna has um, has has uh, got a uh, sort of a basin development model here, um, which she's been able to eke out of the geochemistry and so therefore um, can uh, Im imply the fertility of that region. Um, of course, we are looking undercover for a lot of Australia and here's some, here's some work um, from the Arunta region that Tegan Blakey and others um, completed. And here's, here's a, um, a geophysical data set over here. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's magnetic, so um, over gravity. And here's a lovely um, geological map that uh, Tegan got out of it. Now, um, it, there's a lot of granularity in that map um, taken from the geophysics. There's hardly any outcrop and there's hardly any ground, you know, there's, there, there really is hardly any outcrop, so hardly any ground truthing. Um, there's just a detailed, um, uh, the detail from one of those areas. Um, now, so that, that geological map ha is, has come out of someone's head without much um, ground truthing. It, they take a really long time to do those interpretations manually, as you probably all know. Um, so one of the things that we're doing at CSIRO is uh, trying to um, develop decision support mechanisms to help us make those maps, okay, to not, not replace our heads, but to help us make those maps. And here's an example here. So um, here's a, an area in the East Yulgan here, the Yamana region. There's really not a lot of um, outcrop in that region. As you go out this way, there's no outcrop at all, really, in terms of the basement um, uh, that we may be interested in. And here, are, um, here's an, out, uh, an output here uh, of a machine learning um, a clustering sort of random spatial random forest machine learning um, output uh, from that region. So what, what's happened here is we've taken the potential fields data sets, um, uh, applied this uh, spatial random forest machine learning algorithm um, to that um, potential fields data sets. And we've, we've basically asked, us to, asked it to find us eight clusters. Now those eight clusters uh, do correspond to geology pretty well, we think, um, but it's, this is just a decision support tool. So now we can take these, um, this information and then compare it to drill core information and that kind of thing and apply rock types to these to these um, regions. The, the, the good thing about this is, is we get an uncertainty map um, that comes with it. Now, it's not uncertainty around the geology, it's uncertainty around the data that, um, uh, you know, the, the overall clustering that's been um, completed. Okay, and here's just another example of that. So if we just go back, there's the data sets that went in. This is what came out of it. And it's the equivalent of doing that, basically overlaying things and drawing lines around um, features. But it's a 3D problem, okay? And what I've shown you so far is in 2D. So it's a 3D problem. Um, we can look at, um, you know, the uh, 
sort of data like seismic to, to get that sort of a two and a half D um, uh, indication of what's going on. We can invert our geophysics to get to get a 3D component out as well. Um, we can build our models based on um, drill core analysis, sort of in sedimentary basins. So these are down to about 500 metres, these, um, these um, drill cores. Uh, we've been able to map out the FASIS distribution here. And here's a conceptual model from eight drill cores, basically it's a little bit of outcrop. This um, area is about 80 kilometres by 80 kilometres. We can test our models by running stratigraphic forward modelling in basins, okay? And then we can take that model back into our conceptual models and go, well, we predict that there'll be a channel developing just about here. And we're looking for those channels, maybe. Okay, so we can do that as well. And we can take that information and look at fluid flow models as well. So we can apply um, different types of modeling techniques. So we can take our structural interpretations, a fairly rough structural interpretation here. We'll need, we need to sim simplify those interpretations into our fluid flow models. We can take the stratigraphic model um, outputs, um, in this case, um, percentage of shale throughout that basin. We can put that into our model and then we can do some things like in, to form the region and just pre um, predict where the greatest amount of fluid flow was through those, um, perhaps around those shales in this particular region, sort of looking for copper. Um, we have a lot of geophysical data and geophysical data um, has, it, it's what we use to get that 3D um, look really or that 3D information from a region but we're not always very good at dealing with our geophysical data um, and if you've seen what's going being um, talked about on LinkedIn um, lately you'll see that there's a little bit of a crisis around um, teaching um, for geophysics in, in, in Australia at the moment as well which is not great. One of the things we're doing at CSIRO is we're de developing, developing a new platform called the Geophysical Processing Toolkit. We, we started to do this primarily for um, EM data quite a few years ago and um, so basically you can drag your EM data set in, you can start to have a look at your EM, here's an example here, you can plot all sorts of things around your EM as well um, and the idea is that we'll be able to easily integrate um, different tools and, and things like that into this toolkit. Um, this is sort of early days at the moment but the, um, the reason why, we, why we've, we're focused on EM is that we couldn't see a, a good solution for um, making sort of EM available to the masses um, um, going forward and given EM has been, um, is being collected right throughout the nation at the moment, we think it's really important to develop these sorts of tools. Um, in 3D though, we have, we have our geological maps over this country and, and they're, they're pretty good. Um, so here's a, this is 50 kilometres by 50 kilometres um, in the Southern Pilbara. Um, and there are now new um, programs that he's mapped to loop where we can take these maps and, and quite quickly um, using the structural information translate a 2D uh, map into a 3D model. Now these 3D models aren't perfect. Here's one that's about 200 kilometres long and 100 or so kilometres wide again from the southern Pilbara. Um, but, be but before we had map to, f map to loop um, they would take that, that previous map would, would, would have taken you know a, a month a couple of months to actually draw and you've done it and you're never going to change it okay, because it's taken you so long to put together, basically. Um, if we can use these sorts of programs, um, we'll be able to speed up our, our 3D um, um, models. Um, what's really good about these as well is that we can start to slice them. So when we, this, it, it, from the Southern Pilbara, like if we, if we slice those, that, that, um, that, that first map I showed you or that the first 3D model I showed you, we can look around these red areas here where the different strata has thinned. And this is where um, the region is prospective for iron ore, okay, where the thin, thinning has occurred. So we can apply our, our mineral systems understanding um, to, the, to these models. Um, other new um, techniques we're using um, for um, analyses, uh, here's the Ultrafines Plus um, uh, project. Uh, and basically here you can see, and you've probably all seen this before, but you can see some geochem at the top here. Um, uh, th this data at the top was, um, uh, the, the samples were analysed using fairly st um, standard um, geochem protocols. And this, 
and at the bottom here, the same samples and the ultrafine um, fraction was removed from those um, same samples and that was what was analysed. You can see that there's more uh, gold anomalism is coming up in those samples um, of the ultrafines. Okay, so, um, but taking, doing that probably isn't enough. We need to think about how the landscape has developed through time. So um, what has actually gone into making that those, those geochem anomalies? Where have those geochem anomalies come from? So one of the things that we've developed at CSIRO is using supervised machine learning. Um, we've developed um, a way of, uh, of applying that to landscape evolution or landscape analysis. And if we look at the um, Ultrafines um, project again, um, in this particular, um, in these maps here, for, for these particular data, we would consider everything above this red line as anomalous. But when we apply the landscape evolution um, mapping, we can see that we may have missed some anomalous samples. So what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're comparing oranges and oranges, not oranges and apples, because we're looking, we're thinking about how those regions have developed through time um, and what the, what the um, regolith or how, how the regolith is, is um, affecting it, um, our results. Um, hyperspectral mineralogies, um, CSIRO have, have um, got a lot, of the a lot of skin in the game when it comes to hyperspectral minerality, having developed or built the first high logger. Um, and here's an, um, an example of that. We know we, we, you know we all know what these things look like now. We get core, we run them through these machines, we get lots of squiggly lines. And I get in trouble all the time for calling these things squiggly lines, but that is what they are. So it's, it's not really direct mineralogy, it's indirect mineralogy that we are interpreting from these lines. Um, we can see lots of things in those, we can pick out um, different um, uh, perhaps um, interfaces in, in our regolith um, um, in our regolith which is really good uh, might be important in terms of um, sampling different parts of a, a, a regolith profile but we can also turn those that mineralogy which are essentially squiggly lines which um, translates back into numbers into geochemistry or into geology, okay? So we can do that by applying our deep domain knowledge on, on, on what that mineralogy or what those squiggly lines are representing. Um, we can train our data sets to, to tell us something else at the end. So this is um, something else that we're, we're doing at CSIRO. Um, we call this the Rosetta Plus framework. Um, and we, we're basically um, using the, the fast, less expensive sensor, sensor data to try to predict the more time consuming and costly geochem data in, in this case here. Then we can take that geochem data and we can put it into something called data mosaic. And data mosaic is essentially another um, uh, uh, program, if you like, or a software solution that essentially can take numeric data. It can um, look at that numeric data, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, um, it can do a sort of a multivariant um, analysis on that data, and then it can give you a multi-scale plot. Now, this multi-scale plot equates to logging. Okay, so you can then equate that to, say, lithologies, maybe a, a formation, maybe a group. Okay, depending on what you do, you have to train your, you actually have to train your, um, uh, your, your data for this. Um, another tool that we're developing is um, targeting tools for in indicator minerals. And this one, this particular um, uh, project here that we've just started is for um, targeting for nickel deposits, which is, the, you know, which obviously are quite hot at the moment, but we're building on the years of, um, of nickel expertise that CSRO has to, to do this. So for this particular project, um, we're looking at um, finding uh, fertility indicators of, you know, in situ mineral signatures. So when I say that, I mean from rock, uh, basically, so from an intrusion, um, but also vectors. So those detrital or resistate minerals that we, we have preserved perhaps in our regolith that we can, we can analyse and then relate back um, to the in situ. Um, we're doing this by um, uh, looking at uh, su subtle variations within the mineralogy um, of, of these um, sorts of samples. Um, as I said, this, this project has just started. It's been um, uh, developed by Louise Schoneveld, um, Steve Barnes, Margot Lavalant and, and, and others um, at CSIRO over the years. Um, 
and we've got about I think nine or ten sponsors on board on board this so we're hoping that we'll be able to develop a workflow that can be um, down the track licensed to a lab. Um, the Cloncurry Metals Project. So um, I'm almost finished my talk today, but um, I'm just going to give you some exam an example of um, well, one of the issues that we have with exploration and bringing that digital together, that that, that digital um, component into the the domain um, knowledge um, component is that is that the data sets are collected at different scales often. Okay, so what the um, team did recently um, in Cloncurry is it is that they um, using 30 sites or 30 different uh, mineral deposits from the Kongari dis, um, district, they collected co-located petrophysics, mineralogy and geochemistry from those sites. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but these are the sorts of um, data that they collected essentially, and they tried to collect them at the same scale. Here's one of the outputs um, from, from one of those particular deposits. And you can see that they've been able to, you know, have a look at what the zoning looks like um, in the mineralogy and also in the geophysics as well and, and the petrophysics. Um, so some of the work that they did was with SEM TEMA um, or the TEMA, which is an, an SEM um, instrument. And here's an example of that. You can see the, the mineralogy in these samples in, in a lot of detail. Um, what, what, but one of the issues with this kind of work is that it takes a really long time to take one of these, um, to, to analyze the, the, these um, samples with, with an SEM. So about say eight hours or, or 12 hours or whatever, depending on the resolution you wanna get, I guess. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these very um, uh, high-end um, analytical tools and translate them into something that industry can use um, in the field. So we're doing this um, in this particular instance for the, for the, for the mineralogy using um, the LIBS basically. Um, this is quite new work, but basically you can take a, 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 cut, a cut sample here, say a piece of core, and you can analyse that core and you get a, um, a, a map of mineralogy. Now, the reason why we know what that mineralogy is, is that we've also analysed the same sample with the TEMA. And we've ba basically been able to um, but we've been able we've been able to take our twenty thousand team arounds and, and analyses, and train um, train a libs data set to understand what the mineralogy is in the same place, basically in the same places, and so we're we're, we're um, now taking this out um, into a project with Northern Star. This is Adam Bath and others, and he's been able to get his maps from libs trained with Tema. And the results are, are pretty good. So the resolution of the LIBS is less than the, than the SEM instrument, but it's absolutely good enough for what you need um, uh, at a mine site or maybe even in a sort of an advanced um, uh, exploration um, uh, program. So 12 minutes scanning time for each of those rather than eight, eight to 12 hours. No sample or very little sample preparation can be set up and run in the field. Um, and you basically get quantified mineralogy. And then we can take that information out um, at, at, to the larger scales. This is only a few kilometres by a few kilometres, but you can see that we can take those mineral maps um, out, um, put, uh, relate them back to where they've come from and have a look at that mineral zonation um, in a region to, to inform our programs going forward. Um, so I've just... I've shown you examples from all around Australia today of some of the work that we've been doing. Um, essentially, what I just wanted to get through was that um, we have to think across all scales. We have to think in 3D. We have to obviously use whatever data we can get our hands on. But we also, I think, have the opportunity of bringing that very specialised domain knowledge together with um, with machines and develop decision support mechanisms to help us um, to drive our, 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 our decisions into the future. Oh, there's another one. And um, th that's it. So that's where we think CSIRO sits, somewhere between universities and industry, hopefully, and hopefully developing um, tools that the industry can use going forward.